an yeki sa sani noble people of this land gunashish masicho thank you so much for allowing me to come here today and to share some of the ideas pertaining to self determination and ceremony that i think are worth sharing I'm sure you've probably noticed lately there's been a lot of drumming going on around Turtle Island. A lot of singing, a lot of dancing, a lot of ceremony, a lot of movement of our people, an uprise, really a transformation and an awakening of our hearts and our spirits. People around, our indigenous people around the world are standing up together. And the common denominator between them is the drum, is our songs, is our people putting on their regalia, is our people bringing out ceremony to be the middle part of what's going on. So today, one of my ideas that I wanted to talk about is the integral part of ceremony and the reclamation of that as we move forward in our self-determination here in the Yukon. When I think about the movement happening right now, I ask myself, why is this happening? And it reminds me of a story, a story from my own childhood that I experienced growing up here in the Yukon. I was 10 years old and I went to Whitehurst Elementary School. And this school was, in those days, pretty rough. It was pretty hardcore. Maybe people here remember those days, but life was quite different than the way it is now. It's quite different than the way that our children are experiencing the world as being First Nation children. In those days, kids were coming to school really poverty-stricken. They were experiencing parental guidance from people who were barely surviving the residential schools, had just come out of the residential schools. Things were really bad. And I remember thinking to myself, why is it like this? What's happening here? And one day, we had a new teacher, and she came in, and I was in grade five, which means I was 10, and so were the other children. We were all 10-year-olds. And this lady came in, this new teacher, and we were quite excited because we had a new teacher. She came in, and she looked at us. And as soon as she came in, because you have to remember the situation of the children, they were very, very poverty-stricken. And somehow, I lucked out in my childhood because my mother and my father made a conscious decision that they wanted to bring their children up in a safe, healthy, nourishing environment. So they worked very hard to provide that for us. But the rest of the children that I grew up with were not experiencing this at all. So they came to school in rags. They had no lunch. They had nobody to take care of them. They were really, really pushed down by society. In those days, racism was a lot more blatant. It was just open. It was overt. You know, I remember hearing things that these days people probably wouldn't say so openly, or if they are saying them, they're not, they're not so cur courage, with so much courage to do it. So our teacher came in, and she looked at us, and she had such a look of disdain. She actually had hatred written on her face. She had a look that was very disturbing to me. And I wondered to myself, why is she looking at us like this? And so she started to teach us, but she wasn't teaching us. She spent the whole class talking about why we should be clean and why people shouldn't have lice and why people shouldn't have ringworms. And I looked around the classroom and I saw my classmates sitting like this with that look that became so familiar to me when I was a child of people being oppressed. And at that moment when I was 10, I realized I had an epiphany. I had a very crucial moment of my life where I realized I had to do something to change the situation. And when I looked around the classroom, I felt very strongly in my heart that this lady is trying to hurt us. And how could she hurt us any more than we are already hurt? How could she push these kids further into the dirt than they were already pushed down? It just couldn't be possible. So at that point in my life, I realized my life had to be about changing the situation so that our children will never feel that again, ever. In, 
an idea. So in 2007, I had a crazy idea. I was just coming back from the University of Victoria where I was doing indigenous governance and I came back all, yes, we're gonna like have self-government and we're just gonna do this and you know everything's gonna be great. So I came back and I was very fortunate because my family and I got to move out to Carcross, which is where I'm from, it's our traditional territory. And so we found out the train's coming back to Carcross and I felt, oh, okay, we need to get a part of this action. You know, the First Nations people here need to get it, get in on this uh, tourism pie. So I had this crazy idea to, ha to put a show together where all the tourists were going to come, they were going to watch us every day, and we were going to make a lot of money, like lots, because there's, you know, like hundreds of thousands of tourists coming to Carcross. So I gathered up a few youth, and I said, we're going to do this show, and uh, come out to Carcross, we're going to have fun. Somehow we accessed some funding, we had a lot of encouragement from our First Nation, we had a lot of encouragement from the community, and so we we worked on this show, we put this show together. When we started, there was only a couple of people who actually had experience dancing and singing before. And um, most of the kids there were, you know, I shouldn't call them kids, they were youth. They were young adults. They were just starting out. So we really had nothing, and it, we worked very hard at putting t together a show. And once the summer started rolling, we were there every day doing our show, and then we realized uh, people aren't coming, the tourists aren't coming, they're not coming to our show, what's going on? And so we tried all sorts of different tactics to try to lure them into our theater. We went out on the train deck and danced and sing and sing, sang. And when we were doing that one day, I noticed that the tourists were just walking by us. They weren't even acknowledging our existence. And here we are, on our own traditional territory, bringing out our regalia, singing our songs, which are sacred to us, and they were just walking by. And so I said to the crew, because I looked around and I looked at them and they looked pretty, they looked pretty heartbroken. They looked pretty sad about this. So we went back to our little theater and I just said, you know what, who cares? So we had to redefine our success. What does success, what did it mean to us? Obviously it didn't mean making a lot of money and becoming rich off the tourists. So. We sang every day. We made that commitment. We're coming here every day, and every day we're going to sing our songs. Every day we're going to drum the drums. Every day we're going to put on a regalia. And in those days, we didn't have much. I always joke around that all I had was a hat and a scarf in those days when we first started. So we made that commitment. And by the end of the summer, we realized we're not millionaires, but we're rich. We have something substantial. We have something that's going to take us somewhere. Because people were changing. People among us, their hearts were awakening. And people am among us were literally saying, when I started this, I didn't care that I was First Nation. By the end of the summer, they were saying, I need to learn my language. I need to hold this up. It's my responsibility. I need to learn as much as I can. And we are not stopping. We're not stopping. Let's just keep going. Who cares what anybody else thinks? Who cares if they like us or not? We're going to keep doing this. So that's what we did. So self-determination and the realization point for me, I just want to share with you how that happened because I didn't really get it for a long time. Self-determination, what is that? So it actually happened for me in somebody else's community, not even my own community, where I had this big realization what it is. We, um, we've been able to travel down to Vancouver Island quite a bit and spend time with the people there, the indigenous people there. Some of them are our family members. And one community invited us for a potlatch. And you might know or you might not know that potlatch is a very sacred ceremony to us, practiced all up and down the northwest coast and in the interior of the Yukon, Alaska. It's very important. So we went to a potlatch there, which was happening for four days. And it was really amazing because whenever we talk about the potlatch in indigenous studies or any type of university program where you're learning about Canada's Aboriginal people and our relationship, we always hear about a community called Alert Bay where, because potlatch was outlawed, it was outlawed. We were not allowed to potlatch. We were not allowed to practice it. So in Alert Bay, 
People were actually arrested and put in prison. Their stuff was taken, their regalia, their masks, all of these things that are so important to us, which we consider sacred, were taken away, burnt up, or taken to Ottawa, to the Canadian Museum of Civilization. So I had this in the back of my mind that here we were in an area where this happened, where people were actually arrested. So the potlatch started, and I don't know much about their culture. We're similar, but we're not. And somebody told me, somebody's going through initiation. Somebody's going to be initiated into one of the most sacred dances, dance societies here. And so we came to learn that somebody was, before they got initiated, out in the woods, and they were fasting. They were practicing ceremony. They were literally going to go through a transformation, a transformation of self. So um, we, um, we witnessed this young boy. And what happened was that he was out in the woods, and he was in turmoil. And when they brought him into the, the potlatch once in a while, we saw that he was wild. He was wild and savage-like, and he had all these hemlock and cedar branches all wrapped around him. And there was a point in the potlatch near the end where he literally, where literally the rest of the dancers of the society brought him in and all of these branches fell off of him. And he transformed into the most beautifulest, strongest dancer I have ever seen in my life. So it was a literal transformation through ceremony of a boy. And when I saw his face, I realized this is somebody's baby because he truly was a boy. And he transformed right before our eyes into a beautiful dancer. His role, that's what he's going to be now. And then at a moment outside the big house, I was looking at their big house, which is like a long house, and I thought, this is beautiful. Like, we need this. We need this in our community. We need a place so we can practice ceremony. So I asked this lady that was outside with me, who did this? Like, who came and built this for you? And she said, we did it. We did it ourselves. Um, I said, oh, you got a grant? And some people came in, some carpenters came in. And she said, no, we built it. We built it. And our artist painted the front. And our artist carved the poles inside. And this is an important place to us. So that was when I realized what self-determination means. It really made sense to me that the most important things that happen in their community happen in the big house, and they did it themselves. And hence, more meaning. So that real realizing was very, very important. So how do we live ceremony? How does it translate into our lives every day? Well, for us, it's, it's quite easy. It's quite easy for me because I'm a dancer and I sing and I drum and I practice a lot of things that we're trying to reclaim. Ceremonies that have been lost for many, many years, we're reclaiming them back. We're reclaiming all of these things that have become hazy to us, but still exist. One of those was a seclusion ceremony that we had for my young daughter when she was transitioning from a child into a woman. And the reason we did that is because she came to our dance practice one day and said, I heard a song, and she sang the song. When she sang the song, I immediately realized we need to do something. So that, to make a long story short, is that's another TED Talk in itself, was we went out into the land, and she went through a ceremony, and it was a very important thing for us. The last person in our family that actually did the ceremony was 96 years prior, and that was our Auntie Angela Sidney. So we brought back a ceremony that is very important. Through our, our sacred potlatch, the Kuik, this is where we practice ceremony. Through Hakustiyi, which is in our language means our way, to uphold our values, to celebrate those values, to try to live by those values. These are all the things that are important to us. So when I think about self-determination and I think about the transformative process that we hope and is a part of our vision for our people, I think ceremony is absolutely vital. I don't suggest that it's the only pathway to self-determination, but I'm certainly going to say that I feel very strongly that it's the foundation for our, our pathways to self-determination. Self-determination is like a house. It's like a longhouse. We have our ceremonies, our hakustiyi, our way, our way of knowing the world, our traditional laws. All of these things, our language, our songs, our dances, our drums are the foundation. 
The poles holding up the house are many things as well. We have building capacity and educating our people. We have economic development so that we can be self-sufficient. We have the healing of our people so we can be strong again. And we also have building strong governance. These are all things that are very, very important to us as a people and all come together to make what we call self-determination. So to go back to what I mentioned earlier, about the drums that are beating very loudly right now. Right as we sit here in this auditorium, drums are beating across Turtle Island, which is North America. And not just North America, but the whole world. The indigenous people are awakening, and we're hearing our drums. That is what's at the very core of it, the very center of it. We're singing our songs, and all of this is providing us a way to move forward, strong, healed, proud, and so that our children will never know what it feels like to feel less than dirt. Our children will never know that because of the work that's happening now. And really, at the core, like I just mentioned, and I keep saying, and I will always say, is our ceremony, our songs, songs that we sing that are 10,000 years old, and songs that we sing that are just were made yesterday. So there's no other better way that I can actually think of to demonstrate what I've tried to say to you today other than to call out the following people who, for me, embody what I feel is a transformative process through reclaiming our ceremony and our culture. So I'd like to introduce to you some of my most favoritest people in this whole world, the Dakaquan dancers. Thank you.